So um, some things that I'd like to focus on, I know I, I already kind of talked up a little bit about them would be efficiency and I'll tie efficiency to time management. Um, time management. Okay, so on, on time management, oftentimes from experience, I realize that students have trouble with learning how to move on when they, they are stuck with the problem on the exam. That's probably one thing that I'd like to call out and make sure that you guys um, are aware of that. Uh, there are 20 problems, yes, but, uh, and I think you need about 15 or 16 out of 20 in order to declare to be passed. Um, and so there's a tendency that you can't solve a particular problem and then you, instead of moving on to the other problems we, which you can potentially do, there's this tendency of you focusing really hard and trying to make sure you get that one question correct before you move on. It's, 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 it's one thing that you, I, I would say that you guys have to be very much aware of if, if you've not taken the exam before. Um, try to learn how to move on um, when you are stuck on the problem, because chances are that there are much easier problems ahead of you that you can do, right? And so uh, it, it, it wouldn't be worth it wasting lots of time on one problem. So that's something that you, you have to keep in mind. The other thing that would help you a lot in terms of managing your time would be the use of the calculator. Um, and uh, the calculator is my really favorite place to go. And the reason is because if you can learn to, um, to store certain your values or your interim calculations on the calculator while you use those numbers to do your, your calculation, it really, it really saves you a lot of time. And the reason it saves you a lot of time is SO is likely going to ask you, um, the question that is being given to you follows the standard ultimate in life table, right? And so um, for a person age 60, what do you do? You need to go to the table and pull values on the L sub X and pull values on A double dot um, sub X and, and so on and so forth. And what students do really would be to copy those numbers from the table by writing them down on the script. Well, uh, the simulation I had three years ago with students that I mentored um, for, for the LTM exam actually proved that. Um, and I, I, had, I had two different simulations, right? Like four people writing, um, writing out the parameters from the LTM table on, this, on the paper before they begin writing uh, the solution. And I, I think I had about three or four or so people also um, you know, like storing the, the parameters from the table right on the calculator before beginning the, uh, you know, engineering the solution script itself. And I found out that 80 to 90% of the time, those folks that actually store the values of the parameters from the live table on their calculator before beginning, or maybe somewhere along the line, you know, start doing some, some uh, manual calculation, 80 to 90% of the time, those folks end up beating time by close to about 40 to 50 seconds. Um, and I, I didn't simulate that, that activity on really tough problems, really, really, really easy problems. Um, so, but I mean, one, one minute or 60 seconds can make a lot of difference in, in this exam. So uh, part of the simulation that we'll do today would be giving you exercises and problems and helping you, um, you know, practice the, the habit of storing those values on the calculator and then using them throughout your interim, interim calculations, your, your, your solutions. Because you think about it, right? It, it, you can, if you, if you need to pull four or five different items from the table and you write them down on the paper, as you start engineering your solutions, you get to a point you still need to plug numbers on your calculator and then check and see if those numbers, well, you probably need to do some arithmetic on your calculator and then use it to 
um, for, for some other equations again before you end up arriving at the final answer. So that process becomes very re repetitive. If you already have the numbers stored in the calculator, whatever metric that you wanna do, it's so easy. And the reason it's easy is because any interim arithmetic you do can also be stored again on the calculator. So you don't have to waste time by writing the interim um, sort of arithmetic you do on the calculator, copy and paste the values again on the scrap sheet of paper that you have. And you have all of that process is taking away a lot of time. So, um, but rather saving um, those parameters in the calculator can can really save you tons and tons of time. Cool. All right. So, calculator would be one um, uh, in terms of time management, um, and uh, I tied that to efficiency. Um, and I think the first one that I mentioned, learning to move on whenever you're stuck with a problem is also very, very, very key. Um, so these two combined with your knowledge should, I think should guarantee you a pass really. Any questions on the efficiency management uh, aspect? Um, I mean, with a calculator simulation, I'll, I'll run some problems by you guys, but did you guys have any questions on on the, on the time management component, if you've taken the exam before or not taken it before. Um, I have a question. Okay, would sure. You, would you suggest moving on from a question, even if you are familiar with it, if you think that it's gonna take a while, or do you think that that might that make you lose a lot of points for a lot of questions? That's that's a good question. Um, so I remember there was there was a, a lady who took the exam six times and passed on her seventh attempt. I I try to ran. So usually what I I do for the students is to make sure that they understand themselves and come up with approaches that works better for them. Right. So I'm not going to give a yes or no answer, uh, but uh, hopefully what I would say would uh, helps. What, what, um, what she ended up, well, her problem really was, yes, I know I can solve this UDD problem, okay, um, but I don't like UDD that much. Or maybe you need to calculate some percentiles, but you really dread those problems. Um, you, you found a way to actually understand the problem mechanically and, and and, and uh, end up engineering the solution so you think you can do it. What I found out this lady was doing, she had favorite topics and topics she really didn't like. And so whenever she's taking the exam and she gets to a topic that she didn't like, to my surprise, she still tries to work the problems. Two things, either, either be, become very patient to, to read the question thoroughly and attempt working and get stuck, or go like, okay, this is an easier version of the problem that I have seen before, I can do it. And then she does the calculation and realizes that the answers doesn't match. She goes back again to work the same problem again, over again, um, the first, the second, and then the third time. I think that's just a waste of time. So one thing that I proposed for her to do is, if there are topics that you really dread, you know, you are so good at survival distributions when you see UDD and uh, constant force stuff. You know, those problems are super easy. You can work them out. Sure, go ahead and, 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 uh, and, and do that. If you see a return, on, uh, a return on premiums or a return on premiums question, and you know that's something that um, would take a while. Well, sometimes it's very, very difficult to to tell whether you can do the work, uh, you can do like the task, um, you know, um, or uh, I mean, it's it's just very difficult. I mean, I, I I guess I guess you probably have to like try to start before you you realize that no, there's more to this problem or not. Um, what worked out for this lady really was to skip the questions that she dread, and then move on to the problems that she can, she can do really well, come back and then 
um, hopefully she has a lot of time and then come back and uh, focus on the problems that she really dread. Um, she did that simulation for 10 practice exams and she ended up passing the exam with a seven. So it's very tricky for me to give a yes or a yes or a no answer. But I guess the caution, the caution I would also add is that if you work one problem and you miss, you miss the you miss the answer or your answers don't, don't match the answer choices. The two things, the two things that you could do, if you believe it's an algebra problem that led you to not matching this, the answer scripts, well, you could attempt to fix that algebra problem and then hopefully you got you got it and then move on. But if it's if it's if the question if if it's a if it's an issue of you just don't understand the question properly. I think you don't need to solve the problem the second time. You rather need to move on to the next problem and on and on and on and come back to that problem. Um, you know, when uh, if if you if if time permits. I I, I know I, I circled around this uh, this this question a little bit, but it's because it fits into the time management scope of my discussion. So which which is why I seem to be um, Blah been quiet a lot, but hopefully what I said really helps. And because uh, uh, the time management part is really, really important. So mitigating wasting time on the exam is, is, is something that comes with practicing um, or working uh, sample problems. Did that help, uh, Rachel? Yeah, that, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, great. Any more? Yes, or, I do have a, I have a okay, question. Uh, I'm actually writing farm. That's combination of farm L and farm S. Okay. And, and uh, is there any advice you can give on time management? Because it's like I'm combining farm L, farm S, and I understand it might be a bit uh, tedious, like knowing one the the syllable structure itself is much, and uh, I know there might be some questions that might be tricky. Then. What strategy do you advise one can apply so, to be so efficient? When, so when you say you, you're taking both FEML and FEMS, uh, these are two separate exams. So you're not taking them at one sitting, right? You're, the two sittings are piece, right? Uh, it's FAM, which is combination of FEML and FEMS. Oh, on, so one sitting, but has both S and uh, L on, on that exam? Yes. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that that exists. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, and how many hours is that for the exam? Is it four hours? Yes, four hours. Interesting. Okay. Um, okay. So um yeah, let's let's talk about your case um after maybe after the session, I can have a, a personal discussion with you on phone. Um, to talk about the the S component, right? Because the the S component, uh, there are some things that I'd, I'd like to mention to you there too. Since that wouldn't really benefit everybody, um, just keep in mind. Oh, let's yeah, let's just touch base after the session and then uh, have that discussion. But yeah, 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 that's that's a good question if you ask me. The S is a lot more involved than the L, so I understand your concern. Uh, any more before we move on? Maybe just last one on uh, efficiency and time management before we move on. Okay. All right. So the expectation is that you guys would um, be ready for the exam by now. And so um, the, don't expect me teaching everything on the syllabus, I'm just going to focus my attention on the things that I think you guys need to really understand um, in order to be um, able to be uh, successful on the exam. So cool, let's see here. Um, anything else on my, before, all right, cool. Um, I'll start with, UDD and the constant forces on assumption. All right, so 
A quick question to you guys, and it, it will be very interactive because I'll be throwing a lot of questions to you guys, okay? So I'm not going to be the only person talking. Please try try to help me by uh, by staying engaged. Uh, now, so this really direct question here, what do you think um, as UDD and constant force, um, and why is it important for this exam? Or you can you can talk along the line. Why would SOA give you a problem and then and say that you must assume UDD or constant force? Why is that necessary? Anybody? All right, so while I wait for somebody to general, generously say something, I'm just, I have the, the questions open on my other screen, but since I'm writing on this, on my iPad, I probably have to pull them in um, here as well. Uh, anybody? I'm assuming that for constant force of mortality, maybe it's for simplicity. I don't know. I don't know if it's practical in terms of real life business problems, but it could be maybe, but it makes things much more simpler to solve than using like a, um, a non-constant force. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a good attempt, yeah. Um, it does make things simple, so which is why the, the assumption that the assumption is important. Um, okay, um, so let's see. All right, I'm trying to look for the problem that I had written down, question 211. Uh, 211. Okay. I took this 211 because it says the question is taken from Fame L exam, October 2022. All right. So, well, before we wake that out, actually, this is what I, I want to use to make my, my claim on why it's important to understand UDD and constant force. Okay, so let's look at this problem. Okay, without reading the problem fully, check, let's see, the, the second preamble in, in this question is telling the, uh, the student to assume, to assume the, the constant force of mortality assumption, right, um, in, in working the problem. This, this second problem, 3.2, um, takes a different approach by asking the student to assume that debts are uniformly distributed over each year of age. So between these two problems, the rationale for throwing in a constant force um, and the UDD is, this, is basically the same. So just like Rahel say, said, it, it's for simplicity, yes. And the reason the SOA would need to throw in that, that assumption is because one, we need to understand that the constant force assumption and the UDD assumption, right? These two assumptions are used to approximate, uh, they are used in approximating um, discrete events to continuous events or continuous events to a discrete event. So if you are given a question in a, in a, in a discrete world, where in a discrete world you have a mortality table, just like the problem you see in front of you. The problem that we have is giving us a discrete integer valued data on, on mortality. And so in order to be able to calculate anything continuous, we need to be able, we need an assumption that can link the, the, the discrete world and a continuous world. So it acts as a link to be able to do that conversion really, really easily. 
these problems are pretty straightforward, really. Um, but I think this will make my claim even much stronger. So for 3.2, for example, preamble number two is asking us to assume the UDD as to UDD. But let's look at the preamble, the, the other parameters given in the question. We have the complete life expectancy, which is continuous, given to us for a select age 65 to be 15. What does the question demand? The question demands that we calculate another continuous variable, but this time around for a different age selected. So the reason why the UDD assumption is really important is because we have been given a discrete data in a discrete world, which is the mortality table with a one year select period. In order to calculate the E not 66 select, we need the UDD assumption to, to serve as a link between the continuous world and the discrete world. So without that, you cannot work this problem. You need an assumption. Now, why am I spending time explaining this? Because um, on the old L on the old LKM exam, there was a question thrown by the SOA, and to my surprise, the SOA actually did not tell candidates to assume UDD or constant force. But the only way to work out that problem is to is to assume something, either constant force or UDD. And so, since the question was very vague most candidates got stuck. So there was a comment over there that the SOA made, usually for the old exam, when you take it, they release all the problems on, on their website and they make the, the solutions are there. They also make comments on um, what, how students performed on, on each problem. And the comment was that students did not realize the importance of the application of UDD or constant force. Because, the only way one could work that problem really is to assume either. And they had the way ready to actually give full points to anybody that adopts UDD or constant force. So that makes me think that for, um, for, for the multiple choice exam, they can throw in a problem like that. And so that's, some, that's a problem that I know for sure most students would spend over eight to 10 minutes on trying to work that problem. Why? Because a very easy problem to do, but you don't have enough information to be able to work out the problem. And if the SOA would do that, there is a way to, to write such problems that whichever approach the student chooses, either constant force or UDD, the solution, the integer value solutions would be the same. And so if you solve maybe one, you get like 14.03 for UDD. And maybe the constant force you get like um, 13.97. They all approximate to 14. So problems like that can be written on the exam to trick students. And students who don't really understand the importance of that would end up wasting a lot of time because they know the problem is really easy and they can work that problem. But it's impossible working the problem without an assumption of CF or, or UDD. So hopefully that, that sort of clarifies um, you know, or uh, enhances your understanding of why the UDD assumption is important or why the CF assumption is important for, um, for exams like this. Okay, so let's, 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 get, let's get busy with, um, we're doing real stuff that I want you guys to, to benefit from. I'll start with, Question two, one, one, and just show a couple of things. All right, I'm gonna give you guys about 30 seconds for you guys to, to read the problem and then we'll, we'll all discuss the problem. But keep in mind, I will, uh, I will be asking you guys questions. So please stay engaged before we end up working on the solution. So 30 seconds to read the problem fully, Two point. One one.
Okay. All right. Um, any thoughts about the question? Let's let's brainstorm. And uh, the first question I would ask: um, How would you write the intended probability in actuarial notation? Calculate the probability that a person aged eighty point six will die between the ages eighty one point one and eighty one point six. How can we write this in a in a, in actuarial notation? Uh, can I have uh, somebody to, to call out how to write that? And I, I can do that on the screen. You will now be flexing anybody if you do that. So please let's, let's engage. Anybody? In actuarial notation, how would you write that? Uh, okay, let me contribute. Sure, please do. Uh, it will be Q, it's, uh, okay, yeah, 0 0.5 deferred, 0 0.5 Q, 80.6. 0 0.5 deferred is um, 0 0.5, 80.6. All right, yes. both schools agree or disagree? And that's correct. That's how to write it. Um, okay, so, Hopefully by now you all know that there are a couple ways that you can you can you can solve this problem, right? And hopefully all of you can work this problem. Now, um, I I I want to share an approach to working this problem, which is based on students that I know uh, really do struggle um, on on working problems like this, especially once once they see the decimal numbers and they begin to you know, uh, sort of um, blank out. Okay, so hopefully by now you know that this can be written this way. You can write it in a Q way in terms of mortality as a function of mortality, or you can write it in terms of survival probabilities. It, take this, it's always easier converting these problems to P's than, um, yeah, 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 Morgan, yeah, thanks for that, Morgan. Yeah, if you don't want to talk, you can just leave comments and then uh, I have my, I have like three different screens. So one is for comments for sure, I can see. Okay, so feel free uh, to leave comments. So in terms of P's, this is going to be written as we have P, um, P0.5 or 80.6 minus um, P, uh, minus P what? Oops. Uh, 80.6. Okay, so this is one way you can write this, or you can write it the other way where you have, you have in terms of Q, or you can write it, um, you survive up to this time, and then you, you sort of like, uh, you know, and then death and death kicks in. But the P way is really, really easy. Uh, to do. So I'm just going to share with you guys like uh, an alternative approach to, to work in a problem like this um, when, whenever, you know, um, you have like a bunch of decimals floating through. So let's focus our attention on P80.6 since that's easy to work out. So the purple guy circled. Uh, I'm going to focus my attention on working that uh, now use that as a demonstration. So P80.6, this is basically um, S80, 81.6 divided by S80.6. Hopefully you guys know this by now. Uh, it's, it's basically a conditional statement, right? It was saying that uh, we're looking at the probability that you live one more year conditioned on the fact that um, you are currently 80.6 80, 80, 80 years. Or basically, or said another way, the probability of living 81.6 to 81.6 conditioned on the fact that you are already 80.6. To work this problem, you could, do, you could do a little bit of transformation. So look at the given question, the parameters given to you in the question, 
you have a Q80, you have Q81, you have Q82. So at least the parameter Q80 has been given to us. So if you look at the way I got, I got, I, I set up stuff over here, um, I am going to choose an 80. So if I multiply this by S80 divided by S80, what do I end up getting? I'm going to do a little bit of a reshuffling here. So reshuffling, I have S81.6 divided by S80 times, I'll pick another color, perhaps red, um, times we have um, S80 divided by um, S80.6. Okay, so right in this another way, uh, switch back to purple, we have S81.6 over um, S80 times um, S80.6 uh, over um, S80, uh, but you need to make sure you invert this guy. So the guy written in red is what is what I'm invert. Um, and the reason for the inversion is because um, the first product becomes P80. And what do we have? P80, we have um, 1.6 minus this guy becomes P80, 0 0.6, but we'll take an inverse. At this point, it's very easy to work this guy out using UDD or constant force. And hopefully you guys know that for a UDD, uh, what, how would you write 0.6 P80 in uh, assuming UDD? Let me just ask. Assuming UDD, I always take the opposite, which would be Q and then times with the fractions. Okay, so you mean one minus, um, my, okay, what minus uh, P80, 0 0.6 uh, this way? Yeah, and then just take the fraction, to, then just calculate for Q, um, 0 0.6 Q80. Okay, 0 0.6 Q80, and then that's, that's, that's easy. Excellent. So this would be uh, the UDD approach. All right, how about the constant force approach, 0 0.680? How about that? Then I can use straight. Uh, oh, go ahead. Yep. Anybody? Um, I yep. guess we could say P80 to the power zero point six. Okay, P80 to the power zero point six, and this is the constant force assumption. Excellent. Mm -hmm. All right. So the approach becomes very mechanical using the basic formulas that we've memorized. Really easy. If, um, I mean, if you look at the SOE solution, they have a different way of doing that, which is okay. And sometimes students find, have a hard time understanding their solution, uh, which is why uh, I think Arctex teaches this approach as well, but this approach really is in the, uh, the Bowes textbook, the actual mathematics uh, uh, written by Bowes. Um, this, this approach is highly, discuss in a very rigorous manner using um, like the way we do stuff in uh, probability. Um, and it makes, it makes calculation really easy also if you're familiar with the actuarial symbols, which I believe by now you guys already know that, right? So, so um, in working this problem, for example, so P80, um, it might look a lot, but all these steps can be, can be condensed into like two, two or three lines. Um, what can what can alongside the calculator um, or will have that simulation but I'm just demonstrating how you can convert some of these um, you know statements into uh, mathematical statements or arguments that really helps you do things mechanically without having to think so much about what you're doing okay so, so far, do we understand um, how to, is it clear on how to, how I conditioned by just multiplying through by 
um, S80 and S80 because that multiplication really doesn't change anything. It just means you're multiplying the same um, a factor by one. And it's basically that factor itself. And then you do some rearrangements and then um, ultimately end up, you know, um, applying your UDD or constant force and working the problem. I know the question specifically said that uh, when debts are distributed between 81 and 82, they are subject to a constant force, right? Um, so, and from 80 to 81, they're subject to a UDD. So this would have been calculated, uh, this guy would have been calculated under the assumption of UDD, because it would be 80.6 all the way, uh, actually um, 80 to 80.6 would be uh, the dimension. And that falls within what the SOA provided that if that's, uh, uh, if that's uh, between 80 and 81, then the, uh, you assume UDD work in that problem. So UDD can be assumed. Okay, so if what I did actually makes sense to you guys, I want to give you guys a little bit of an exercise here. Try to write, I'm going to circle that in green. Try to write this, this guy in green by following the steps that I just, I just discussed and give me the final versions in terms of P's. You, mind you, you might have to um, do things. Uh, maybe you might, you might need an extra step of repeating what you did again somewhere uh, in order to have all of the P's coming together. So try it. Um, 0.5, P 80.6, I'll try to replicate what I just did by conditioning on either 80 or 81, whatever you want to choose, you end up, you'll end up getting something that would match you being able to pick up any of the parameters given to you in the question, um, plug in numbers and then solve. All right, I'll give you guys, I'll give you guys about um, 60 seconds to try to do that. I'll need about three answers from you guys I, in order to do the demo. So please be ready to uh, provide me with some answers. Um, I'll add about 20, uh, 20 seconds. It's actually not supposed to take one minute because <laughs> it's very mechanical. So while folks still work um, the problem out, uh, let me just write so 0.5 P86. So we what we are trying to do right now, okay, let me check. Zero point five P eighty point six. All right, any answers? What will be the final? expression in terms of P's or K's, whichever way you have it. Any attempts? I can try. <laughs> yep, please go ahead. I think I have, I don't know if this is right, but I think I have 
1P80. 1.1. Okay, so here's the deal. Here's, here's what I want to gather. Um, the final answers should be such that, um, actually, you go ahead and give me your answer. My bad. Never mind. Just give me all your. <laughs> Okay, so I have 1.1 P80 minus. P80 minus. Uh, 0 0.6 P80 inverted. Uh, 0 0.6 P80 inverted. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, it looks like you yeah, not really, not quite, right? Mm -hmm. Because um, all right, I haven't worked it out myself, but um, I think not quite also because I wouldn't expect a 1.1 here. You probably need to transform this one more time because as it stands, it doesn't look like you can pick, you can work this 1.1 p80 by picking any of the parameters directly from the question q80 q81 q82 mm -hmm. uh, that can that cannot happen um yeah but good attempt um any any attempt can i have uh, another bet another person try uh Okay, for me, I, I, the understanding I have, the approach most times I use in solving questions like this, mm -hmm. is using the uh, the linear interpolation approach, like uh, L eighty one point one over L eighty point six, and yeah, since yeah, we are, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and since we are already given uh, in the question, mm -hmm. I can I can just suggest like mm -hmm. from uh from the question let, let's say you're starting with l80 you can say let your l80 be 100 mm -hmm. and you use that to do your calculation mm -hmm. yeah yeah i uh, yeah i yeah i i yeah not to cut you but i understand where you're going that's 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 why i said there are so many approaches in working this problem um yeah it gets really tricky using the approach you're, you're describing um, with some problems. So can you, did, were you able to work out what I did, uh, the con, like how I conditioned, work out to get some peace? What did, were you able to try that? Did you, all right, never mind. Let's let's I, do. I need to learn this approach then. Okay, well, it's it will cool. take a while. <laughs> right, it will take a while. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, so yeah, um, it's completely fine when if, if folks cannot uh, contribute. But let's let's go through it uh, one more time. Um, so um, it's I mean it might look a little a little too new um, if you're not familiar, but. Um, once you, you try to do it by yourself one or two or three times, you realize that it's so mechanical. You don't even have to think that much um, by, you know, picking arbitrary numbers and testing out things and thinking it's very mechanical, which is why I think a lot of students love it when I, when I, teach, I teach it to them. But let's, let's see how to do it. 0.5, um, 80.6 here. So convert that to a survival function was, was, the, first, was the first step. So if we, um, it will be, what will be the, the age the person will survive to? It will be 81.1 um, actually, right? So 81.1, which is what um, I think Rachel was trying to do. So 81.1, over um, S80.6. At this point, what I can do is I can choose to do S81 divide through by S81 and S81 multiply by this ratio, which is essentially one, or I can use 80. I prefer to use 80 here. Um, 
Uh, yeah, so let's see. So S80 over S80. So what does that give? Uh, you just shuffle things a little bit. So we have S81.1 over um, S80 times. I am going to do some inversion right here. So 80.6 over um, S80 and make sure that you invert this guy. This guy has already been solved, okay? So this guy is exactly what we did over here, P8, 0.6, P80. And so it's so easy. You'll go back and pick that number, calculate it, assuming the UDD, and just plug it in there. You don't have to do any extra work. What you need to what play out with would be um, S81.1 over S80. So we need one more transformation for that. So how do we do that? So C, um, S81.1 over um, S80. I can choose to multiply this by S81 and S81. Just look, take the integer portions and use that as your trick variable to do. All right, so we have S80 here, and then you invert this guy. So the purple guy is, is our focus now, because we already know um, the guy in red, we already know what that would turn out to be. So if we shuffle the purple guy a little bit, what do we have? We have um, S81.1 all over um, S81 times um, S81 um, over um, S80. So I'm gonna bring, so let me, just for completeness, we have S80. 0.6 over um, S80. Um, so invert that and go back to my purple guy. So writing everything in P's, it's going to be P81, 0. Oh, P, wait. Um, did I miss something? So P81, oh, okay. P point one. Okay. P eighty one point one times we have P eighty times this is uh, P eighty zero. Oops, I meant to write this guy actually in uh, in red. So now the, all of the parameters can be picked directly from the question. This would be, um, you can get this one from the constant force. Um, P80 has already been given in the question. Okay, so in question, and we already sold for, uh, for this guy up there, okay? So already sold for. You only need to pick 0.6 P, uh, P80 and invert that number. Um, so putting everything together, the answer to putting everything together, we have um, 0.6, So we have uh, 0.5, 80.6 minus uh, P80, 0.6 would be equal to 0 0.1, 81 times P80 times um, 80, 0 0.6 invert, and then minus, P80.6, uh, where is P, the one we did first, where is it?
Um, wait a minute. Um, okay, one point. So we did this part. So this is the part that we were supposed to solve. Did I miss something? I'm trying to put all the pieces together. So let's see, let's go back to uh, 0.86 P86. Okay, uh, that was solved in the 1.6 P80. Oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I I see why I got confused. Oh, okay. So um, the purple guy circled over here, P80.6. Um, the P80.6. I'm not sure why I can tie my, um, I can tie everything together. Uh, where is my P, or maybe I didn't write, oh, no. I think you left it in Yeah, I left, yeah, what I have written here is wrong. It's it's not from the um, the answer itself. I was trying to write the original question, um, how we expressed it into P, I, I, I didn't do that right. Um, yeah, apologize, guys. So, um, yeah. So this is what I was trying, I was trying, I was trying to write this. Uh, I was trying to write all of this and I ended up writing it wrongly. Um, but if you guys get the gist at all, it, you can basically work this problem out manually by just conditioning on a selected age. And once you do that, you are just basically re-expressing everything in terms of P's and Q's that can be used directly in the question um, with an application to the UDD or the constant force. Um, yeah, uh, the, 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 the other approach is what the gentleman talked about. Uh, you can, um, no number was given, oh, which is, I think that's what the SOA did actually in terms of solution. Um, so yeah, but it, the fundamental question too is uh, they could also give you some cohorts in terms of number of survivors and all that. And that changes the dynamics a little bit. Um, so uh, with this approach, you are just virtually engineering like a really mechanical approach to work in the problem. So uh, I would encourage you guys to make sure that you go back and, um, you know, try to replicate this problem, follow the steps and see if you can work out the final solutions using the numbers or the parameters given the question and see if you can get to the intended answer. Um, okay. So again, we talked about what, why UDD and constant force are important when given in the problem. Uh, so I'm just recapping. And we also talked about, um, so, Condition on the fact that we know how important or how to apply UDD and constant force. We may have a, a question given to us that may not be, that may not explicitly tell the candidate that you should assume UDD or constant force. In that sense, your understanding about why it's important to link a continuous world into a discrete world or linking a discrete world into a continu uh, um, a, a, a discrete world into continuous or vice versa. So that understanding is really, really key. And for problems that problems such as 2.11, you could use the SOA approach of working out things, which is what they did. It basically choose like an arbitrary number 80, uh, 100, and then use it out through, through, through the solution. You could use that approach as well and then apply the memorized UDD formulas really easily. So that's, that's also an approach you could take. Um, if you don't feel comfortable using that approach or you just don't know when or whether that approach is applicable in all instances, then this approach can save you a lot of time. Um, and 
at least you're guaranteed that you understand clearly what you need to be doing. And you can just do a little bit of conditioning and some cleaning up and end up having expressions where you can plug numbers into. Cool. Um, so I'll do one more, I, one more demo and then we can, uh, we can take a break or something. So I think the other demo that we'll do, I'd, I'd like us to spend some time on um, practicing or rehearsing how to use the calculator uh, for three different functions. So function number one, so um, use of calculator. So the function number one of the calculator would be storage. Uh, function number two, um, so function number two, I'll call it So testing, so it's a, it's some sort of test, okay? So this by this you use the table function. The table function. Uh, and then uh, number three would be, um, so there's a, a statistics worksheet. Oh, by the way, I hope you all using this calculator. Where is mine? Okay, it's right here. I hope you all you all have the TI thirty X calculator right here. I hope you all have it. So, um, yep, this is the only calculator that does the the table function then. Um, by doing some trial and error. And I'll explain that really shortly. So these are the three core functions, at least um, to my very best understanding um, for, you know, on, 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 that you, you can take advantage of, you know, that to save a lot of time. So apart from just doing like basic arithmetic and confirming uh, products and sums and differences and uh, checking whether the answers correspond to the alternatives you've been given. These are three other functions that you, I'd like you guys to be aware of. So on the issue of storage, okay, there are um, how many storage capacities on the calculator, um, the TI-30XS um, calculator. I uh, probably should just pull it up. Um, so we have um, TI-30. Uh, XS multi view. All right, so this is what I'm referring to here. Uh, I'm not sure why it's not that clear. Oops. Hmm. All right, but okay, so with a multi view calculator, they're about so we have. A, B, C, we have X, Y, Z, and T. So that seems to seven storage capacities. So you can store different numbers in, in seven different variables and then call them whenever you want. And in order to store, it's very easy. Hopefully you guys know this already. If you want to store the number 120, for example, you just hit 120 on your screen and then you hit the STO function right, you hit the STO function and the STO function will, will produce an arrow and uh, you select one of the variables that you want to, you want to store um, that number in. So in this case, I store in X and I just hit enter and it stores the variable in X. And if you want to recall it, all you need to do is to just hit X, enter, and it, it brings the number. So- Sorry. Yep. Can you please repeat on how to use sure. it? If you hit sure. Okay. Sure. Let's do it. Um, so uh, on storage. Mm -hmm. 
So let's assume that we want to store the number um, 1200. So go ahead and press the, num the number 1200 on your screen. Mm -hmm. And then hit the STO, so 1200 on the screen, and then hit the ST STO button. STO. STO. It's, it's to the left of the number oh, one. Yeah, here. Okay. Good. Once you do that, you would see an arrow, mm -hmm. right? And basically, it's asking you, why do you want to store 1200? So, and go ahead and press the number Y. Y is tricky because you have to hit, um, you see on top of the STO, you have this X, Y, Z, T, and you have A, B, C. Mm -hmm. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see that. In order to get a number Y, you need to hit it, that, that button two times. So if you hit it two times, one, two, it would, it would give you a Y. Yeah, okay. And so you say, store 1200 in Y, and in order to confirm that it's been stored, you need to hit the enter button. So, okay. um, S, so the next would be, um, so the X, Y, Z, T, A, B, C, mm -hmm. and then you hit enter. When you do this, it means it's been, it's been stored. 1200 has been stored in a variable Y. Mm -hmm. So how do you call it? If you want to call it, you actually don't need to do anything. Just on top of STO, all of those variables, it hit on that button um, two times. So hit on, so to call, um, to call 1200, okay, just hit the um, X, Y, Z, T, um, A, B, C um, button mm -hmm. twice, right? Um, and if you hit it twice, it would say a Y, and if you hit enter, it's 1200 that, uh, that appears on your screen. Okay. Did that work? Yeah, it worked. So if I want to mm -hmm. apply something, I can just do Y, like Y divided by 10. Okay. If you just do Y divided by 10, then you're yep. gone. Yep. Okay. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we'll look at that simulation very shortly where we'll look at an SOA problem uh, that's very tedious and requires you pull in numbers from, from the fame L table and you would, will have two simulations. We'll have two people doing it, uh, I mean, some people doing it manually by copying the numbers from the table on their papers and we'll have a separate team storing them. Then afterwards we'll, we'll switch again. So everybody gets to, to practice something. Uh, the goal would be, we wanna see, who is much more efficient. Hopefully people don't cheat because they've seen the question before. So they are faster in working out the problem. But it, the, the story is you save yourself a ton of time rewriting things on your paper if it's just stored once on your calculator. Okay, great. Uh, so storage is one. Um, let's move to the second one, two. The table function. For trial and errors. So the table function can be located just to the left of the button clear. Okay, so uh, to the left of the button clear. Great, so if you hit on this table function, it's gonna ask, uh, okay, I have stuff in there. Uh, let me erase all of that. Um, so table again, good. If you hit on that, you, you will see um, y equal to, and it's asking you enter function in x. Why is this really useful for this exam and other exams? So the guy taking the FEM S, uh, this is an incredible tool that you need to take advantage of uh, with all the policy limits and deductibles that can be thrown into such questions sometimes. Um, you will, or even for exam FM that we know, 
as it throws a problem at you and you have to juggle between some cubic polynomial or some quadratic equation, solve for an I, and then finally, once you get that I, you need to do maybe something like one plus I to the power N is equal to, uh, let's assume 0 0.430. You, you work out a quadratic in, in obtaining I, and so an I is 5%. So you now have 1.05 to the power N equals 0 0.430. The question is, then the final answer is, is asking you what value of N makes this possible? Well, this is actually very easy. Imagine that um, you're working intermediary steps that requires a quadratic equation. And that quadratic equation is an intermediate step that leads to the final answer. I tell students, don't waste your time working quadratic on the exam if that's the last thing you need to do to obtain the answer. Why? The table function can save you a ton of time. A quadratic equation is only a function of a single variable. So if you have something like, let's say, um, I squared minus two I, um, two I um, plus 10 is equal to zero, for example. And this step leads to the final answer. All you need to do is to construct this equation in, um, construct this equation using the table function and try out all the alternatives, A, B, C, D, and E, okay? So to do that simulation, I need to show you guys how to use the table function before we can use, we can apply it on a question because you're going to do the application. So let's make up something um, really easy. Um, oh, there was, a, there was a demo I was doing. Oops. Da -da 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 -da. Yeah, just a moment here, table function. Okay, that was a demo that I was doing. I think I saw, oh, yeah, I'm trying to look up that number, 4.7. Okay, well, we'll use that for the demo instead. So let me just create something by myself. So um, X plus two, um, x minus five is equal to zero, we do know. So if we work out this quadratic, we have um, x squared minus what five x plus two x minus 10 equal to zero. So we have x squared minus what um, three x minus 10 is equal to zero. So let's say we have an i squared minus um, three i minus 10 is equal to what? zero. Actually, to make things really easy, uh, what I, I want to allude to is actually to set it to be equal to 10. Okay, so I have option number one, I is um, for, <clears throat> let's assume the number five or two would represent it's in percent, right? We, we, don't, we don't accept negative numbers. So I'm gonna put a four here and B, I'll put a five. Um, C, I'll put a six. D, I'll put a seven. And E, I'll put um, an eight. So we, what we, the exercise, what we wanna do is um, go ahead and hit the table function once. Wanna hit the table function once, you're being asked, to enter a function in X. So the X variable is what you have to use throughout. Okay, just keep that in mind. It's always the X variable. You cannot use any other variable. So go ahead and construct X squared minus three, um, three X. Just this, you cannot include, do not include um, the 10, okay? Don't include 10. So just do um, X and hit the X squared. So we have X squared minus three X, just like that. Um, are, we, are we all good?
Are we good? Did we follow? Okay, thumbs up. Yeah, thumbs up if you're good. Are we good? Yeah, just say something or make a comment. <laughs> Uh, five. What's that? Oh, no, no, we, we're following the steps. We, we're following the steps because I want to explain how the table function works. So do we, you don't need the final answer. Just construct x squared minus 3x on your screen, the calculator screen. Do we have that? I think so. So when we get X's, we just do the same thing, the X, Y, Z, T button? No, no. I'm saying that um, we, okay. Do you, have you set up X squared, but have you set up the function in there? X squared minus three X. Have you, do you have it set, it set up in the table function? So that's what I'm asking. Is it, I have X squared minus three X. Excellent. Okay, yeah. if you have that, go ahead and press enter. So when you press enter, you see a different screen. Yeah. Screen start equal to zero, step, mm -hmm. step equal to one. You have auto and you have ask X. So um, in, in FAM S, for example, or even LTAM, the old LTAM, usually there is something we call the Thiele's differential equation. Uh, you, you'll be given some step sizes to do some approximations uh, from continuous to a discrete version, calculating the value of an annuity or uh, the value of uh, an, an insurance or, or just doing reserves. So you may be given a step size of let's say 0 0.3 to do that calculation. And so usually the table function is the only, is the best place to go um, cause then if you step it up, you can just choose a step 0 0.3. So it means put everything in increments of 0 0.3. And so the answers, the pattern it would generate, the final answers that would generate will be based on the step size of three, but we don't need this for fem L or fem S. For fem L and fem S, we need to ask X. So go ahead and press enter until you hit auto. Once you hit auto and auto starts blinking, use the, um, the right auto button to hit the right and move from auto to ask X and then hit enter again to confirm that you don't want the calculator to assume numbers between numbers with a step size of one, but you want to test out your own numbers. So you navigate to ask X and hit enter. If you hit, hit enter again, okay, would be blinking on your screen. Um, are we all good at this point? Uh, navigate to ask X, hit enter. Once you hit enter, okay would be blinking. And if you see the blinking okay, hit enter again, then you see a screen made up of an X and a Y this way. So what we are going to do is that we're going to try out the values A, B, C, D, and E to see which one actually would produce the number 10. This is our target. Our target equation as x squared minus what 3x is equal to 10. Our target number is a 10. Um, so basically we're trying to tell the SOA that oh, we're smarter than you. Uh, we don't want to work too work, you know, we, we don't need to work out a quadratic by doing this minus B plus or minus squared of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. But if this leads to the final answer, okay, I can construct an equation in a single variable and test out all the alternatives you gave me. Whichever one that matches, that's my answer. I move on. You reduce errors doing just taking advantage of the, the table function. So if we see the screen this way, go ahead and do this. Put in the first value, A is equal to four. So put in, just hit four, 
put x equal to four and hit enter. What is the corresponding y value on the screen? I'm getting four. Uh, Rachel, what's four, that? Yeah. I'm getting four as well, four. Okay, you're also getting four, excellent. Now go ahead and try um, x equal to five. Hit five and enter again. What do you have? 10. We have a 10. So we are done. The answer B is the solution to the question, 5%. Because the intended, um, the, the intended number is it's a 10, right? And so x equal to 5 produces a 10. We are done. We don't need the, the, the quadratic formula in order to evaluate this quadratic equation. Set it up and try all the numbers, you're done. There's an interesting question in exam P, I remember many years ago, which has to do with combinations. Um, so you have the question, actually, uh, you are supposed to find a number of, um, uh, the total number of samples that produces a particular probability. And so you have N combination three, um, let's say 0 0.3, uh, to the power, um, uh, to the power three, and zero point seven. The complement would be uh, at minus what three? Is equal to this produces uh, some probability. Let's say zero point four seven. Now, you think about it that uh, that past SOA problems. If all of you have seen it before, this can be a really, really, really tedious exercise. Because in order to get this done. There are two ways. Student A might smartly just pick the answer choices and try it one by one. Okay, that's also okay. By doing it manually, that's also okay. Student B, who really doesn't, who is not really prepared, might just end up write, writing stuff like this, right? I'm um, sorry. Um, and then expand and expand on this. Um, 0 0.3, probably just things that, you know, this might, might do the magic, uh, 0 0.147, uh, divide through by these factors to wash them away and end up having this guy and that guy in N. And this will lead to multitudes of expansions that will get you nowhere. Smartest way to work this problem is to do what? To avoid any errors. Why? Because even if you try the answer choices, let's say n is a 10, n is a 12, and c, n is a 13, for example. If you're picking them one by one to work this problem, you still have to do 12 factorial, um, 3 factorial, 9 factorial, 0 0.3 um, cubed, 0 0.7 to the power 9, and check and see if this leads to um, 0 0.147. You have to do it manually. If the answer is embedded in, it's, if the answer is answer choice D14, imagine the time you waste in working this problem by trying the number 10, 12, 13, before you, go to, you get to 14 and go like, finally, I got it. No. Well, that's not efficient because you have a tool on the, on, on the exam, which is a calculator that can do this job, okay? So um, yeah, did that sort of make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, okay, great. All right, so, um, and we'll see, we'll see an SOA problem that you can take advantage of using that. There are other problems really, but you know, something really short for you guys to, to have a feel of, of that. What's the third one? So we look at, we look at the storage, we look at um, the table function to do trial and error. Um, let's talk about the statistics and then we can take a, a really short break. Okay, looks like the break that I talked about is even, um, yeah, yeah, I miscalculated, apologize, but well, why don't we just take a five minutes break and then uh, we'll come back and talk about the statistics worksheet. Then we'll do, do a couple more, um, uh, we'll just do one, 
one one simulation then uh, hopefully if you guys still have time i can i'm more than willing to uh to do a couple more before uh, our last session tomorrow all right so five minutes break it's five that is six my time so we'll come back around um uh five five forty central or five forty one central oh. yep I'm around so just in case you want to just chat casually just uh feel free to to do so I'm just grabbing water I have a quick question. Is, tomorrow, is tomorrow's session a continuation of this or is more like a repeat of this session? Tomorrow will be very different in that, um, yeah, in that we'll be working problems. And because of my time constraint, I'll, I'll, I'll say this one more time towards the close anyways, because of my time constraints, um, <laughs> I'm, I plan on setting up, uh, I'll talk to Morgan so we can set up like a platform. We could do um, a Google, a Google, uh, some, some sort of group thing on Google, you know, I, I think Google Hangout or something like that can do the grouping. Uh, so you guys can be uh, chatting over there and asking questions all through all the week leading to the exam. and. Uh, I can I can pick some of those questions and and try to uh, to answer them, um, but to answer your question directly tomorrow would be uh, more problem solving. So I'm, I'll bring problems, give it to you guys, and then you guys would do it, and then we will, um, you know, we agree to disagree, we learn from it, and then we move on. Um, and and then once once we create that group, I'm. Um, there's a practice problem that I have. I can send out practice problems to you guys um, to uh, for you guys to try. And then since it's multiple choice, it's really easy to grade. And I have the solutions already. So uh, what I'll do is that I send it out to you guys. You guys will do it. Email me what your final answers are, but you have to be very honest. Uh, you can't cheat. <laughs> so. And then I'll just greet it and go like, okay, I, I don't even need to grade it, right? Just send it to me and then, then I, I send you the solution, you grade yourself. Um, then we'll have a one-on-one -on -one session. It has to be at Wednesday for sure, because that's the only time that I have a little bit of time to do that. Uh, where you guys can either join a Zoom call or just call me by phone and, and discuss that particular um, practice exam. A question that you found um, interesting and you don't understand or something something else that you want to learn more about I'm, I'm happy to chat uh, we have about a minute more to talk about the uh, the statistics worksheet Couple more seconds. All right. Okay. Uh, was there a question? I saw Emmanuel had a question. Emmanuel, did you want to ask your question? I'm sorry. Yes. Emmanuel. Uh, I, uh, yeah. I wanted oh, okay. to. Yeah. Okay. I wanted yeah. to. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nice to meet you all. I wanted to know uh, when would uh, when would you uh, have a section about uh, exam P? Exam P? Yeah, I think when when is there any uh, day that you be solving some problems on exam P? 
Uh, not particularly. Um, yeah. So um, in future, I plan to do more of these just for the IABA. Um, and the reason is because my focus is shifting highly towards academia. Um, so, but now because of time constraints, I have to do research and have a bunch of meetings, just like I, I did way, when I was in corporate. I don't think I can cough out time to do some of these, but uh, to answer your question, um, not really. Um, yeah, so uh i have three more years to graduate so maybe after three years i can i can get back on track and and do four more exams um yeah i have one requirement left to get my asa i've just been super lazy the predictive analytics exam so hopefully i clear that also out and um i i can i already started the fsa modules in fact completed three fsa modules so that by implication, I will take the FSA exams as well. So hopefully in the future, I, I can actually expand this um, for the IAB and make it like a thing where we can have like really diverse sessions uh, for, for folks to benefit for free. Cool. Anyway, oh, let's oh, Okay, okay. So yeah. uh, can I ask mm -hmm. if you have any uh, uh, materials, study materials for that? I would appreciate if you can share with uh, me here or yeah well unfortunately you know the soes uh, and the soe and the copyright conduct um we cannot share materials uh, uh that's not allowed if you want to use the material you actually have to purchase it um i am an academic so uh, when we write books we just don't share them for free i'm sorry so uh yeah i cannot share books my friend Yufen allowed me to share his questions because, um, you know, per the copyright rules, you need to ask the person if you can use the material. If the person says yes, then you'll feel you're free to do so. But um, those materials authored by Weishaus and um, the app text folds and all that, I don't think those ones are really shareable, unfortunately. So. But yeah. Okay, I get. You. Okay. All right, let's do a statistics worksheet. This is also a very important aspect of a function that the calculator can play. Um, statistics worksheet. So how do you use this really? Well, the, the, the button itself, it's right, it's right below the button delete, right? You see data. Um, so the button is, is called data. And just on top of data, you see this word S-T-A-T -T for start, statistics. So that's where all the action takes place. In order to do any statistics, you first have to enter data. And then once you enter data, you use the second function to call the statistics. And you can calculate things like the mean, the variance, and so on and so forth. So if the SOA throws a question at you that gives you a life table, and you've been asked to calculate the curtailed life expectancy, for example, you don't need to work that out manually. The calculator worksheet will just do that for you really easily. Um, and, and to do UDD and constant force related questions, the, the statistics can do that quickly. Um, well, sometimes just, sometimes the question is so easy. And so if you write down the sketch of the problem on your paper, you can just plug numbers in, but I'll show you guys, hopefully that might take a little bit of time guys, but uh, just bear with me um, because of time, just bear with me. Um, I, I, I want to show you how to use the calculator to, to solve UDD and constant force related questions. Um, it might be helpful because some, if you work out, if you do the algebra and for some reason you're not matching the solution, then, I mean, if you do it by hand and you're not matching the solution, chances are that you are missing something so you could take advantage of 
the uh, the statistics worksheet in order to to do that because the calculator would never be wrong, right? Okay, cool. Um, yeah. So you all know how to do means variances and all that. Um, so I will just say that uh, maybe as a demo. Uh, click on data right now. Um, probably you've seen it before. If you have, just bear with me. Uh, click on data right now. Enter like, um, enter. Um, so let's do for L1 and then L2. We have L3 on the screen once you hit data. Okay, let's use L1 and L2. Enter the number one, two, and three. And in L2, enter the number 101, 102, and 103. So let me do that. Uh, if you hit one, you hit enter, you hit two, you hit enter, you hit three, you hit enter. And then use the left arrow sign to navigate to the L2 column. And then hit 101, enter, 102, enter, and 103, enter. So you have your data being entered over there. Uh, hopefully you guys are catching up. It's super easy to do that. And then you use the second function. Uh, you hit second function and start, S-T-A-T. -T. So second and that, um, you would see something on your screen. Number one on your screen is called the var starts number one on your screen. It's one way variable. It means you only wanna use one column. And the number two is, if you navigate down, the number two stands for a two-way variable. So you want to use two columns, L1 and L2. And in order to do like UDD and constant force, you need to use the two-way variable to do that. And so if you hit on if you hit on number two or just navigate down to number two and hit enter, um, it would, you would see something else on your screen, X data and Y data. Um, L1 will be blinking and Y data, X1, X data will be on L1 and Y data would be on L2. So just keep hitting enter until you, you get to calc or calculate, which is calc. And if you hit enter again, it produces all the summary statistics for you. Uh, so you can now think about how powerful this can be and can save your time if you have like, you know, you need to pull stuff from the, the live table and um, uh, that can be a little time consuming. If you pull stuff from the live table and you write it down on your paper uh, and then you have to do manual calculation, well, you could just enter them really straight into L1 and L2. If you really need those, you need, need the statistics function to do anything, you could just plug them in there directly and then use it instead of writing stuff down. But the beautiful, the beauty also is that it gives you like all the summary statistics for mean variances, standard deviation and all that it gives you all of that. So you don't have to, um, you know, do anything manually. It would also do things like summation of X and summation of what X squared, X squared for you as well. So if you need to sum up a bunch of Q, um, QX, you know, um, let's say if you need to um, um, NX, if you need to sum up a bunch of kills in, in order to do something, you know, you, you can think about using the, the statistics or the data, uh, statistics, statistics worksheet for, for all of these exercises without having to do them manually. Okay, so let's, um, to do, to spend time, yeah, to do a demo, I think I might just use one problem um, to, what was the problem that I noted down? Um, Cause I know, let's say question 4.5, I will just take advantage to explain that as well before tomorrow. Um, so 4.5, yeah, students dread problems like this really. So I'll take advantage of, uh, of the session to also explain the concept behind this problem and show you a calculator approach to do it 
rather than depending on the SOS um, way of doing it. Um, yeah, so yeah, anyways, so let's read through the problem. Uh, for a 30 year term life insurance of 100,045, you are given uh, preamble number one, the debt benefit is payable at the moment of death. Number two, mortality follows the standard ultimate life table. Number three, um, you have the continuously compounded rate delta to be 5%. And preamble number four, debts are uniformly distributed over each year of age. The goal is to calculate the 95th percentile of the present value of benefits random variable for this insurance. So uh, before we jump on into working this problem, right, let me just ask, why is UDD important in this question? Anybody? I think it might help us when we reach like fractional calculations. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. Um, yes. That's, that's the main reason. What's the secondary reason? If we want to convert to discrete, because it's Excellent. Already... that's it, right? So you have a preamble number one that tells us that the debt benefit is payable at the moment of death. That's continuous. We're living in a continuous world. And then in preamble number two, all of a sudden, if debts are really uh, continuous, why do you ask us to look up stuff from the standard ultimate life table? Really, it's because we want to convert from a continuous world to a discrete world. So we need a link between the, the moment of death in a continuous world and a discrete integer valued life table. So we need UDD. And to, and to what Rachel said, that's accurate. It would get to a point where some fractions and decimals would appear. And when that happens, that UDD would quickly do the conversion for us. Nice. Um, let me pull this the question on my screen here. Then I'll navigate away on the other screen. Then I'll just navigate away and uh, and, and solve it. Four point four point five. Okay, I got it. Four point five. So, um, it's a term insurance. To what this problem? This problem hopefully would lead us to. Uh, learning how to use the, the worksheet in working UDD and constant force problems. So first of all, uh, it's a 30 year life insurance um, product. The present value random variable Z can be constructed this way. Hopefully you all know this by now. Um, so to write a present value random variable, it's, which is always very helpful to do, um, you know, to what problems like this. So I know like coaching actuaries and TIA and all the other manuals, they talk about how to construct these. Um, and so, yeah, anyway. So for a, a 30 year life insurance, we have the minimum of T sub 45 capped at 30. And this would only happen if the future lifetime of this individual 45 is within 30 years. The product pays nothing if T sub 45 is greater than 30 years. What does that mean? Provided you, you live the next, uh, sorry, if death occurs within 30 years of your lifetime, you will be paid insurance to your beneficiaries. If you survive beyond that 30 years, you receive nothing, right? So that's the construction of what I have here. So in the old LTAM, uh, the second, the, the written answer portion, you see stuff like this, which is, which can be a little daunting, writing them out. But for the purpose of these, this exam, I'm pretty sure that they usually throw in one question so if you dread it, uh, you just want to make sure that you skip this and do all other things before you come back to it. 
but it's actually very easy. So once you constructed this way, we are good. Now, the question wants us to calculate a 95th percentile of the present value rendering variable. What's the trick here? The trick here is something we learned in calculus, which has to talk about the monotonicity of a function. What does that mean? Every function, by definition, if it's continuous, okay, condition on its continuity, the function can be monotonically decreasing or monotonically increasing. What does that even mean? It means that if you plug in, so it means if I have V to the power T sub 40, this V is essentially E to the power negative delta T sub what 40. If we plug in numbers between, uh, between this, what happens to the function v, v, v to the power t sub 40? If you plug in zero, if you plug in one, if you plug in the number two, you realize that the values of vt, v to the power t would be decreasing. So as the person ages, that discounting factor reduces. Why? Because we're plugging in a higher value is for the exponents. And so we expect that the result of e to the negative number, a, a large number would be small. So what this means in calculus is that this is monotonically decreasing. How do we take advantage of this monotonicity concept in insurance? The trick to do uh, this is to memorize two key concepts. Very easy. One, for an insurance product, it's always monotonically decreasing. Well, I'll caveat that. It's, um, um, what's the best way to, uh, to, to, to caveat always? Um, so it holds, it holds in general, but it does, it does have some, some exceptions for sure. It's what it's, but SO is never going to throw something that has an exception to you on this exam. So it would hold. For insurance, your, uh, the, the present value random variable will be monotonically decreasing. Monotonically decreasing. And for an, an annuity, for a life annuity, the present value random variable will be monotonically increasing. Okay, it will be monotonically increasing. So what's the shortcut for these two really? To work out this problem as a shortcut, uh, let me open the problem again. See how I'm going to write it. Be for a percentile question on this test, if it's an insurance, and you actually calculate some alpha percentile, all you need to do is, all they are asking you to, to do is that, find that 95th lifetime. If you can identify the 95th lifetime of the person, then you can, by virtue of the monotonicity of the function, you can just plug that T sub 45 back into, into this guy, and then you get, uh, get your result. So how do we do, what's the shortcut? For insurance, because of the monotonically decreasing nature, what do you do? You pick T, P, X, and you say it's at least the same as, at least the same as the 95th the percentile. How is this intuitive? Why is, okay, for insurance, let me write that and explain. For insurance, TPX would be at least one minus 0 0.95, which will be 5%. Why, why is this trick really important? This trick is important because by the definition of a percentile, what's the definition? probability that t sub x is less or equal to a t is equal to some alpha. The less than sign 
maps onto monotonically decreasing nature of every function. Okay, it maps onto it, and so, and so, all you need to do is to say t. You want to look for that t that characterizes the ninety fifth percentile of the person's lifetime, and so you do tpx is greater than or equal to ninety five percent. If the if the if the same question is being asked, but then the SOA decides that okay, we have a, a bronze problem from fall 2017, we're just gonna make it an annuity and see how students will react. They, so they make it a term life annuity on the same, and then basically gives you the same thing. What you need to do this time around is to just equate TPX to be equal to five percent instead. Because the inverse of monotonically decreasing is what monotonically increasing. And so if you are using 95% for the, uh, the monotonically decreasing insurance, you must use 5% and you can work out the algebra. Very tedious, but not too tedious algebra. You can, by inference, the monotonically increasing nature of the function would map to 5%. You can show that mathematically. So the shortcut to this question is to just solve the question this way. 45, TP45 would be at least 0 0.95. Next, L sub 45 plus T over L45 is at least 0 0.95. Next, L sub what 45 plus what T is at least 0 0.195 times L sub what 45. At this point, we are good because we just look up the value of L, L45 from the life table and multiply that by 0.95. So um, L sub 45 plus T is greater than or equal to, since I already worked it out, I wouldn't waste time. I would just write 94, 1,882.20. So what's the fundamental question to ask over here, which will lead us into using this calculator? We are looking for, so it says this means what T, okay, makes um, this relation true. So this becomes a high school problem. What relation T or what number T would make this would make this possible? How do we solve it? Now the UDD concept becomes the most important arsenal in this question. The debts are uniformly distributed over integer ages. I'd like to do something. Uh, where is the uh, oops? Uh, I thought I had the live table opened already. Okay, no. Okay, uh, let me scroll down and pull the, the live table, um, tables for fam L. Okay, so we need to remember what you need to do next is what, how can we locate 94,082 um, on a table 0.20? Is that even possible? No way. We cannot in the L, L sub X column, where is 94,000, 65 and 66, we can't really get the exact and precise number. So the UDD becomes a tool for us to, uh, to, to use in order for us to be able to work this problem by doing interpolation between the numbers 65 and 66. This, the number 94,082 um, falls within, uh, it falls within uh, 65, wait, uh, it's uh, an 82, yes. So it falls between um, 94, so it falls between these two numbers. Um, 65 maps into 94, 579, I have the numbers, so I'll write them down and 66 maps onto that. So it falls between these two numbers. If that's the case, then the high school problem to solve would be, how do we interpolate in order to find that T? See what we're gonna do. 
would construct that high school problem and say 65 maps at age of 65, the L sub X, L sub 65 is 94,579.7. Next, six, at the age of 66, that cohort is 94,020.30. So how do we solve this? In order to solve this, we need to um, apply the UDD to do this. I know most of you might have seen the, this problem already, so I don't want to use all the other approaches that the textbook talks about. I'm going to use the calculator approach to show you how to work this problem. Um, oh, actually, you could do it by hand, really, if you, if you, you could do it by hand. Um, if you want to do this by hand, it means the, the question to answer is that, let me just write that question in purple. Um, uh, what is the linear equation, okay, that characterizes So what's the linear equation that characterizes um, these points? That's all that we are trying to solve. Remember, if you have two point x1 and and y1, and you have another point x2 and y2, you find a gradient between these two points. So you have y2 minus y1 over um, x2 minus what x1 is equal to what m then in order to construct the, the linear equation, what do you do? You just basically choose either of the points and use it. So how will that, how will that happen? If I'm using this, these ones, then we have y minus y1, right? Over x minus what x1 is equal to what the gradient, where, where the gradient is equal to the value of this. And then, you can do, just do y as a function of what? This, this is a number, this is a number, so it becomes y as a function of x. That's the linear equation. So then you can plug in the value of, you can plug in this value L into it to find the corresponding value of x. That's the, that's the question we are trying to solve. So you can do it by hand, but I'm not gonna do it by hand. I'll just do a demo by using the calculator and then uh, we can call it a day. So please, if all of you, are, uh, did we follow up until this point before we, we do the calculator exercise? Did that sort of make sense? Yes, it did. Excellent. Thanks for confirming. So let's pick our calculators and hit the, the data function. The, hit data. Um, so to make it uh, practical, L1 and L2. So our L1 is going to have 65 and 66, and our L2 is going to have, um, so we have 94.579.7, and then we have 94.020.30. So please go ahead and enter these numbers into L1 and L2. Nine four five seven nine point seven, and then we have nine four zero two zero point three zero. Are we good? I, a thumbs up or just unmuting and saying yes would help. Are we good? Yes. Okay. If we have the numbers entered, then we need this the statistics worksheet. So let's go ahead and hit second button. So just hit the button second and call out the stat function. So second stat. And then once you do that, navigate to two vars, two var starts. So navigate down to two var starts and hit enter. Okay, once you hit enter, you see X data is on L1 blinking and Y data is on L2. It's not blinking, yep, but it's on Y L2, which is what we want. 
press enter until you get to the calc button, blinking and hit enter again. Okay, at this point, you should see, I'm gonna ask a question next, okay? So uh, that would let me know if you guys are following. Um, so you should see all those bunch summary statistics on your screen. Remember, the, the high school salute, uh, question we're trying to ask is that, what value of T produces this 9408.20? Okay, by linear interpolation. So um, to clarify something in statistics, um, if you've taken SRM before, or if you've taken IFM before, uh, the capital asset pricing model and all those uh, models I was talking about, they had the way in a linear form, right? Um, so, um, or if you've taken a basic statistics class before, um, they tell you that regress Y on, you know, I'm just use a, a regress, um, regress Y on some um, variables, right? Um, what that means is, um, so if Y is equal to AX plus what B, for example, what that means is that X would predict the value of Y. So it's very much synonymous to what we did in exam P, the conditional expectations. Um, so this is gonna be an expected value of what Y um, given X is equal to AX plus what B. Because X is, must be a known bar uh, number in your data set. Once you plot those numbers in there, it produces the value of Y. Technically speaking, we're actually doing a conditional expectation, but they actually don't mention it. Very synonymous to what we are doing here. Why? The summary stats that you have, we need to figure out the value of T that makes this relation possible. So keep navigating down until you see, uh, I should have, to, until you see X prime. On your calculator, until you see X prime. When you see X prime, X prime is on the letter G. X prime is on the letter G. Hit enter. Oh, there's a, a little bit of a trick here. Um, uh, a trick here. So uh, on your screen right now, I want you to do um, second quit. Hit second quit before you, before you look for X prime. If you look for X prime already, it's still fine, just do second quit. So we, we say second, um, uh, the second variable and then quit. Uh, you see the reason very soon. When you do second quit, do second start again to bring up your start sheet. Second start and navigate to number two. Actually, you could just say number three stat vars, but navigate to two and do the process all over again. And look for the X, X prime. The reason I asked you to do a second quit and second stat again is because when you look for X prime this time, it's going to take you to your, your full screen without you being inside the data worksheet. So it will take you back to your full screen. The meaning of X prime is really the expected value. So what do we need? We have the L1 column is the age and L2 column is what? Um, is the LX. We do know the LX. We want to find the age that produces the LX. And so the X prime means the expected value of X given Y, that's the meaning. You know the variable Y, but you want to find X. So X prime into, if you write your, your number, the Y value, 94082.20, and you hit enter, tell me what you see on the screen.
what's what value do you see on the screen? This will confirm that you followed. 65.889. Thank you very much for mentioning that. 65.8893, thank you. Yeah. Great. Okay, now I'm happy that you followed. So you see, what was the person's age? The person's age, according to the question, oops, did I miss the question? Oh. Um. Okay, uh, what was the 4.5? So in the question, the person was 45 years old. Now we have that age. So what will be the future lifetime of the person? This is gonna be 65.8893 minus 45 years is equal to 25, so minus 45 will give us actually 20.8893. So this number is what we need to plug in into our present value random variable, Z. So let me go back to the question to construct the final, what, it what we actually looking for, what 100,000. What we actually looking for is, is this 100,000 V to the power T sub 45, which is equal to 100,000 E to the power negative um, 0 0.015 T sub 45. And we know the T sub 45 here is going to be um, 100,000, um, it's future lifetime 0 0.05 little t. What's that little t? We found it already, which is about 20 some e to the power minus 0 0.015 times 20.8893. 20.8893. This equals the final answer. If you do this times 0 0.05 times negative one e to the power um, this guy and multiply by uh, 100,000, you should have 35187.92, which is approximately 35,200. Um, so let's, let's see the question one more time, 35,200. Did we get it correct? Let's just confirm how, I'm curious how the SOA did it though. Uh, from L, I'm really curious how the SOA, oops, how do I get there? Uh, this has uh, questions. Oh, solution 4.5. All right, I promise you guys, this will be the last one. Um, okay, so 40, oh, there you go. So uh, they had 35188, which is exactly what we had, 35188. Is right here. The nine over here would approximate this guy to a 35188, which is 35200. So uh, let's see how they did it. Well, they started out pretty much, okay, they were making comments, blah, 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 and, uh, which must be 5% five, 5 of the insurance of that. Yeah, that's actually very intuitive. What they've done there, it's very intuitive. But on the heat of the exam, it's difficult for us to think that way, which is why sometimes tackling the problems from, from fast principles becomes key. And so what they've done, no different from what I have done, but it's just doing it the other way by reasoning. But in really fast principle mechanics of this question, um, is what I just demonstrated. At the end of the day, we got exactly 20.8893 and multiply that by 0 0.05. Hooray, we got our answer. Okay, any questions? Was that helpful for this 4.5?
Yeah, I didn't know you could do it using the data table. I've always just done it the way okay. the SOA has it. Okay. Okay. So that's cool. Cool. Good, 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 good. All right. So that's um yeah. Uh so just just to recap what we've done today, uh time management is really important. Uh taking advantage of the calculator can help you save time. Learning how to move on when you don't understand a problem or when you work problem once and you don't get the answer, but you know that I could do this, but for some weird reason, you just don't match the answers. If you were 100% sure, oh, it was just an algebra problem, just go tackle it, finish and move on to the next problem. But if you are unsure, do not spend time working the problem, move on to the next problem. And hopefully you can do other problems and then come back to tackle the ones that you left. Saves you tons of time. Three, learn to store variables in your calculator. It's very important. Don't be in the habit of writing things from the life table on your paper. And uh, you look on the paper and then, plot and then type those same numbers back on your calculator. Again, you can just store them on the calculator and never have to keep writing, writing, writing those numbers or repeating them. Saves you time. What else did we talk about? So I think, uh, I think that's, that's pretty much it. Um, so hopefully these give you some sort of um, guide going into the exam. Cause I know a week to the exam, I'm pretty sure all of you are prepared. So hopefully this little demo was helpful and um, um, so for tomorrow, it's not going to be, uh, it wouldn't be this boring. It would be much more fun. I would bring problems and then give you guys problems to just do problems. I watch, I watch you guys do the problems and then we can discuss. And then throughout the week, I send you one practice question. Um, hopefully it doesn't, uh, <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't bring tough problems, really pro problems that I know that, you know, would help you to like refine the way you think about certain problems is what I'll target. Um, but uh, I'll talk to Morgan on the side and Morgan will set up, you know, uh, uh, some sort of platform and put all of you there and then we can chat and interact. Uh, you can put questions over that. Um, colleagues can respond to the question. Myself, I can respond to the question. And then if there are any updates, too, I'll, I'll put them there. All right, sorry we went a little uh, above the time, about 24 minutes above the time, but uh, I apologize for that. And uh, hopefully tomorrow we'll all be on time and we can exhaust uh, uh, that you know, uh, exercise together within a one twenty minute time frame. All right. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And uh, yes, we'll be sending out a follow-up messaging um, sometime next week, Singford and I will get that together. Um, so just be on the lookout for some messaging next week. And yeah, just uh, we'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow session that is happening 4 p.m. Uh, Singford, is it 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Central Standard Time? Yep, yep, it's 4 to 6 p.m. Central, yeah. Perfect, perfect, yep. So we'll be doing that 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. tomorrow, and we'll all see you there. Excellent. Um, All right. Thanks day. for joining today. Thank you very much, Sheikh. Sure. Thank you. All right.